All right, we are ready to go. Awesome. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Jordan Yoakum, and I am your host on this Pages SEO Magazine webinar. Pages Magazine is dedicated to helping marketers of all kinds learn more about the world of SEO. Pages is a quarterly publication produced by Page One Power that collects the voices of our industry and packages them in a creative way that can be shared with all levels of an organization. You can subscribe to Pages at pagesseomagazine.com. In today's webinar, we're going to focus on the ROI of SEO, something I'm really excited to talk about. Return on investment was our focus topic for the last issue of Pages. We are super excited that you've chosen to talk with us about how SEO helps businesses succeed. If you'd like to follow along, you can uh, follow along on Twitter as well using the hashtag pageswebinar as seen on the screen. So let's meet our panelists here. With us today, we have Eric Anga, General Manager of Digital Marketing at Proficient Digital. How are you doing, Eric? Doing good. Awesome. Thanks for having me on, Jordan. Absolutely. We're glad to have you. We also have uh, Charles Taylor, SEO Manager of Verizon Wireless's Files Division. How are you doing, Charles? I am doing well. Thank you. Awesome. And we also have Corey Collins, Search Strategist here at Page One Power. How's it going, Corey? Good. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. I mean, we're here. <laughs> we're in my way in. Yeah. Uh, and additionally, we have Matt Vasquez, who's a uh, growth marketing specialist consultant with a focus on technical SEO and content marketing. How you doing, Matt? Doing well. Thanks, Jordan. Awesome. Thank you all for being here. We appreciate it uh, very much. So what we're going to be doing is today we're going to be answering questions about ROI. Uh, some of the questions are mine based on the topics that you guys have all covered in our last issue of Pages and others are from the uh, registrants for the webinar today. So how this is gonna work is pretty simple. What I'll do is I'll ask specific questions to each of you, uh, then allow for some back and forth from others on the panel. Everybody ready to go? Let's do it. Yeah. All right, let's jump into it. So with the first question, predicting ROI, when creating an SEO plan, how do you calculate the potential return and which metrics are you looking at? Uh, Eric, why don't you kick this one off? Sure. Um, well, SEO um, ROI is really kind of the definition of a furball when you're trying to unravel uh, what, what to expect there. So I'll, I'll try to give less than an hour-long answer to the question. Um, don't worry, I'll keep it to a couple minutes. But, um, but the trickiest part is, as we all know, when you start SEO programs that Many of the things we do, you know, are going to have a deferred return. It doesn't happen like overnight, not the same as paid search in that regard. Um, uh, the, the part that uh, is hard about it is that it also has an extended return. So it continues for quite some time after uh, you finish your campaign uh, that you continue to get benefits even if you don't do further SEO work. But having noted that, my preference is to be able to get to what's the revenue from organic search traffic. Mm -hmm. right? Really simple. Uh, if I can't get that, then I need something which is a proxy for that. But ideally, we're set up so that we can literally get you know, right down to it um, and you know, see how many purchases happen you know, on an e-commerce site. Um, if it's a lead gen site and you're trying to generate a contact us request or, or a phone call, then it's a little trickier uh, and you have to place value on the leads and try to, to measure that. But I want to get as close to the real business goal as I possibly can. So specifically, are you looking at um, you know, cost per click with specific keywords or what are, what are some specific things that you're looking at there? Yeah, so um, uh, what I want to, what I prefer to do is, so you, at the SEO plan level, what I prefer to do is, um, uh, you know, get an estimate of the level of traffic we think we're going to get 
uh, and then understand the average value of the click to the site rather than using a cost per click from paid search. So if the site knows the average value of a visitor, better still the average value of an organic visitor, and it gives me a better estimate than just knowing the Google AdWords PPC value, you know, along those lines. So that's more my preference. Yeah, so essentially when building out the plan, it also helps to know what the, the, the company looks at visitors and how much they, um, you know, how much a visitor is worth to that site as well. So that's other things that you can work on with a, a potential client when creating a plan is for them to understand well, how much is each visitor worth so we can calculate a little bit more ROI when we talk about what we're gonna generate for your website. Right. right. Some, sometimes it's they know their conversion rate of organic search visitors, uh, and then separately they might know the average dollar value of a transaction, and then you just do the calculation to get to the average value per visitor. Yeah, absolutely. Corey, did you have anything to uh, chime in? Uh, one thought I had is, uh, Eric, I, just a quick follow-up question for you is, do you try to segment across, say, uh, products necessarily, but like product lines, if there's like two very different conversion rates or conversion price per conversion, or do you segment out to like one piece of the business or do you just broadly look across the whole business or what are your thoughts there? Um, well, in general, well, you, you can go too far with too much detail, but in general, more detail is, is better as long as the cost of getting the information and developing the plan doesn't become unwieldy. So, you know, if, if there's like three major product lines that we're trying to promote in, you know, as a result of the uh, SEO campaign that the plan is about, mm -hmm. then it would be nice to have the specific conversion rates and dollar values for those three product lines. Cause you know how it goes. Sometimes you'll have a product that sells for, you know, a thousand dollars and it yeah. has a really low conversion rate. And then, you know, somewhere else you have a product at same site, you have a product that sells for 12 yeah. and a pretty high conversion rate. So having that level of granularity is good. Um, but as I say, you have to be careful that it doesn't go too far on you. Yeah. Right? Like you, you don't want to like try to get the conversion rates and average dollar value across a thousand products. Your plan becomes unwieldy at that point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Matt, uh, curious, what are, what's your take on um, calculating the potential return? Yeah, so I agree with everything that was said. I mean, it makes sense to start with simply the search volume, making sure that you have enough demand to harvest with that metric and then going deeper there. Um, that things really start to get interesting when you hit the, the goal completion metric, if you're working in Google Analytics or whatever that is, whatever that conversion is on the site, and then figuring out what happens from there. Uh, a lot of the clients I've been working with most recently have been B2B software companies and SaaS companies, and that's all about free trials, demos. And that's where Google Analytics wasn't really set up to be, I mean, you can build funnels in it, but there's better, a lot of these companies have software like heap and other things that can help you get more information about the people that are going through the funnel and converting. Uh, so I think the biggest takeaway is if you're working with a company like that is to try to get to those tools and that data as early as you can and build trust and trust and, and, and get there so that you can have more informed conversations beyond traffic and goal and, uh, you know, goal completions or whatever that conversion point is. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Charles, oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> By all means, go ahead. <laughs> Let's say, Charles, you got any, uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, so one of the things we do here is I'm always asked this question of uh, what's, if, if we overhaul this page, and that's what people call it, overhauling the page, although it's really just optimizing the page. <laughs> uh, if we were to build new content or optimize the page, um, what are we going to get out of it? That's always the question I get. And so I break down the three metrics, traffic, leads, and sales. Uh, the benefit with a company like mine is enterprise size, uh, enterprise company. I, I spent a lot of time building this data, but I have a general idea of what kind of click through rate we're going to get based upon the ranking we have. Uh, I have really good data on conversion data. So I can plug those numbers in 
I, I also typically know, because I work with our PPC team, I'll typically know what kind of impressions, what kind of real traffic volume certain keywords are getting or buckets of keywords, I should say. So I can get pretty close. I can plug those numbers in and say, look, you know, it's going to take us X number of months just to get a certain amount of rankings, and, and that's going to get us into this kind of position, which will give us this, this click-through rate, which will give us this traffic, and then this leads, and then on our averages, this kind of orders. I find that I always under-promise under and over-deliver, which is exactly the position you want to be in, whether you're in-house or whether you're working with clients. Um, the only problem I've run into occasionally with under-promising is sometimes the numbers aren't as big as people want. And they say, well, and this goes back to Eric's point where once we set this up, once this flywheel starts working, it keeps working for us. And that's something I always keep hammering home. This isn't a one-shot deal. This is a, there's no, there's no variable cost or very few variable costs with SEO. It's kind of a fixed cost. We set it up. As long as we're making sure it's, nothing changes, um, this is going on forever and ever and ever. And, and that's usually the kind of the pitch, so to speak, to sell the different um, business owners to, to doing what needs to be done. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And that actually um, that actually flows really well into our next question. So let's jump into the next one here. Um, and that being, let's see if we can get that up here. Because ROI takes time, uh, months, many months in cases, what type of quick wins should we be looking for along the way just to make sure that we're on the right path with our campaign? Uh, Matt, why don't you kick this one off? Yeah, so some of the quick wins that, especially working with a client at the beginning, uh, it's really good to get a sense of, okay, what is it gonna take to actually produce a certain result for this client given the site, given the competition, given all these other variables. And a couple of the tactics that I try to look for first, uh, first is just seeing if we can publish a page that is hopefully optimized around a keyword with some volume, but we, don't, you know, we won't go for a ton right off the bat, just a small volume, low competition keyword, just to get a sense of, of how we stack up. Okay, if that page takes a while to even get indexed, which was the case you know, recently with one client, that's a, that's a sign that maybe we should pull back and focus a little bit more with the site you know, the site structure and look at more technical SEO things and how the content's being shown on the page. Um, if it performs initially, all right, then we can go in a different, different direction. Um, similarly, you know, this classic page optimization strategy that most SEOs know pretty well, um, which is identifying pages, ranking bottom of the first page, top of the second page, further on the second page and working on things that, you know, aren't going to be super invasive to the page, perhaps some title tag updates or uh, some internal linking, some things where you're not going to have to go through a number of approvals, getting content approved and things like that. Uh, but you could potentially see some strong uh, uptick if it's, you know, it works out. And if it doesn't, that's great too, because now you have information about where you stand in the market. Uh, so those are some of the first things I think about. Absolutely. So, you'd like to start with some technical changes, right? So start with technical, that way when it's indexed, some of the other efforts that are going on with optimization, uh, those things can be indexed and start to see those results um, quicker as the other result, or the, the other um, essential um, strategies are taking into play. Yeah, it's some, it's kind of an educational exercise to help some marketers understand the value of an SEO audit. And sometimes you don't, you know, it's, it's tough from the grasp that you really want 20 hours to dig into this and establish a solid foundation. Mm -hmm. So if I can, you know, sometimes it makes sense to work with them in a way where, okay, we'll, we'll tackle some, some bases, some foundational elements, and then we'll continue to do that alongside the other things that you're really interested in. Um, it's all really about building trust, right? And, and that goes internally at a company and externally if you're an agency. Yeah, awesome, great feedback. Uh, Eric, what's your take on some quick wins? Yeah, uh, so I agree with uh, Matt that some on-page uh, stuff uh, really does make sense. I mean, for me, uh, you know, a technical SEO client, new, new technical SEO client nirvana is that they come to you and the site is pretty messed up. Uh, and, you know, maybe they're getting some traffic, but you, you can find like really easy things like 
oh gosh, they have all the, this entire group of pages that have all the same title tags, or or um, they have um, you know, two deeply nested uh, uh, crawl paths. So some pages are eight, nine, ten clicks away from the home page on a site that isn't big enough for that to make sense. Or um, place no index. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So these kinds of things, and you know, this is, uh, um, and 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 so if you're lucky enough to find one of those, that's a great place to start because it gives you, you know, oh, the new pages are indexed, or a little bump in traffic related to these terms and these kinds of things. Failing that, um, um, then you know, sort of the next layer for me is sort of content. Uh, and dealing with content uh, types of things. Um, you know, maybe they could use uh, uh, 10, 20 informational articles on some topic on the site and it would help fill the top of their sales funnel. Um, this is a very, very uh, easy-ish to execute uh, uh, task. Sometimes with larger brands, which is you know where most of our client base comes from, and it may well be true at Verizon, for example, um, getting content published actually isn't easy. So that might not fit in the quick win scenario, <laughs> okay? Uh, I'm not surprised, Charles. I see you nodding there. Uh, but, um, uh, so, but I am going to throw out one off-page thing that I think are really a kind of a com quick combo of two things off-page, which are also opportunities for quickish wins. Um, just go into Search Console, Get the list of your 404 errors by uh, reported by Google. Uh, find out which ones uh, are linked to from external pages, and just 301 redirect the page that they linked to to the best fit page. Really easy way to recover some link juice. It's fast. It's easy. Um, once you pull the data out of Search Console, you can, in a spreadsheet you can build a 301 uh, redirect instructions in 15 minutes or less, even if you're not even that good. Uh, at Excel. And then the other is to find linkless mentions. So this works really well with major brands. People who have you know, referenced your brand and didn't link, uh, if you kind of reach out to them and say, hey, you saw that you, you, you mentioned us here, um, you know, would you mind linking to the page that you're kind of referring to for people who want more information? So those are a couple of you know, quickish off-page kind of things that you could do too. Yeah, those are some great actionable tips to to take that you can uh, implement rather quickly too. That's that's yeah. great. Uh, Charles, what's the enterprise feedback on that? So what I've found is getting folks to buy in to SEO sometimes is, and whether you're with a large company or a small company, I've had all these same issues with uh, smaller organizations I've worked for. Getting folks to buy into doing SEO, like we all know, SEO works. We know SEO works. We do it but it's kind of like magic to some folks. And so you have to show them, people understand numbers though. So what I'll always do is, let's just take for example, uh, um, we're gonna re-optimize a page, or we have a new page of content that's coming out. Um, we know it's gonna take some time for it to really rank and really bring significant traffic. I'll do two things. Typically, if I can show them in the rankings, in the search results, the page is ranking, they're always happy about that, even if it's a brand term. And, and again, internally, we all kind of know as SEOs, well, of course, they're going to rank really quick for brand terms. But most people don't know that. They don't understand that. And so I can show them within a week or two, say, hey, look, you type in your brand name and this, you're, you're ranking already. You're there. So we're on the right track. And, and I always kind of reaffirm to folks, this doesn't mean we're going to get mountains of traffic or whatever, but it tells us we're on the right track. Um, the second thing I always like to do is within a couple weeks, typically, uh, sometimes even after at the end of a month, and this would work with, if you work with clients, is jump in the search console. If let's just say, again, we're taking a page or a section of the site, you can typically just grab the, you know, show the, the organic traffic. And often, not always, but often you'll find that there's an uptick in the traffic uh, within a week, uh, within a week or so of making the change. And you can send that little, just snippet out there and say, hey, look, I realized we were getting 10 people a day. Now we're only getting 20 people, which is not, you know, but we have double traffic in a, in a short amount of time. And you can even point to the point on the chart where, uh, where things have, where, where things were, where the, the action took place. And, and so again, it's that internal, and Matt was talking about this, that internal education, that making sure everybody understands what to expect. Um, but as far as quick wins, like what, you know, say, what can you do to get things to happen fast? Uh, I think 
Eric nailed it perfectly. You jump in the search console. Search console has all the answers that you really need to get those quick wins. It'll tell you, I love finding things that are ranking on the top of page two. And typically when you go to that page, you'll find that, oh, geez, all I have to do is, if I just tweak the title tag, maybe change the H1, I mean, really basic on page stuff, you'll see that change. You'll, you'll go from the page two to, to bottom or center of page one. Um, and, you know, assuming of course, keep your difficulty, you know, depending on the term. Um, but you'll typically see those jumps uh, if you can do them around a basket of keywords, typically a marketer or somebody has a group of keywords they're interested in, not just one. I try to attack a bunch of keywords at once around the same topic, and then they'll start seeing uh, increased leads, increased orders around that, whatever that product or service is. Um, and they're immediately happy. And, and then you, you, you reinforce that with, like I said, the things I was showing you, where you show people the SERP, you show people the pay, you show people the, the search console data, um, and it kind of reaffirms that, hey, this stuff works. And, they're, and you'll find the next time you talk to them, they're even more willing to speak. And then the next time, and before you know it, kind of the nirvana is they're coming to you, whether it's a client or internal, they're coming to you saying, hey, I was thinking of doing this. What's the best way we can, you know, what's the best way we can integrate, integrate SEO with that? Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, when you're bucketing those uh, keywords, um, do you find it typically you get uh, quicker results or some of these quick wins with some more long tail keywords or what's your strategy on that? Do you have a, a, a way of measuring them out as far as tiers, anything like that? Yeah, I, I, actually, interesting. I was just having a conversation internally with someone about that, about what keywords should we be going after? Um, now, I have an advantage with a large enterprise site. We can, we can start putting high level keywords on a page and then so they start ranking within a few months. Um, so we have an advantage there and I'm not gonna pretend like we don't. If I, was, if I was a smaller site, if I was working, if I was an agency situation, I would definitely, what I would do actually is I would wanna map out, say, let's just say we're going after term X, you know, red apples, whatever. I would want to go after the longer tail first so that you can show those quick wins. But before you do that, you want to map out an entire content strategy saying, look, we, the nirvana, the, the, the key is to get this top level term, but we've got to build our way up to it. So you map out that strategy, make sure everybody understands what we're doing. You do those long tail articles or long tail pages first so that, again, get people to buy in, get people to understand that this is real, this works, this isn't witchcraft. Um, and they can, they can actually start seeing that, okay, this, I'm not spending money. I'm not throwing money at, at you know in, into a black hole. It's, it's actually integrated. It's actually doing something for me. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, that uh, that all makes perfect sense. Um, yeah, and that uh, that takes a lot of people to implement something like that. I mean, you're going to have people creating content, people doing uh, strategy, people um, looking at the on-site. Sometimes that's one person. Sometimes that's a whole team of people, right? Um, so Especially in enterprise. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, the bigger the company, the bigger the team, I think, right? Um, I, I always end, I, so in an enterprise scenario, I, I, you have to create a deck for everything. Uh, if you don't have a deck, it's not going to happen. Uh, I, and I always end the deck. And uh, my OEA a couple of years ago had a great tweet where she talk, tweeted about, you know, how long, does, how long does SEO take? And she put a great tweet in like four to six months or something like that. I always end every presentation with that to kind of set expectation. Um, I also like to use, I just like to use examples. Like, hey, look, we did this and see this four to six was about right. And see, we're, we're getting that non-brand traffic in about that four or five, six month period. And it kind of drills home. It, it's a third party now, even though I picked the quote and put it in the deck. <laughs> it's a third party kind of, you know, entity confirming something I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that helps to have those, uh, especially when you've, you've proven it in the past, you know, it does take four to six months and then putting that in the deck as well, you know, so next time you set up another deck, they have that expectation, look, based on last time, that's what we did, that's what happened, same thing here. Uh, Keep repeating the same thing, whether it's clients or internal, you, you just have to get them used to hearing the same thing, to the point where if you've been working with them long enough, you should smile and say, you know the next thing I'm gonna say <laughs> is X, Y, Z, and I can see Matt and, <laughs> and Eric have done this many times. <laughs> It's about the time you get sick of saying it yourself that you know you've said it enough. Awesome. All right, so let's, uh, let's jump into the third question here. So in what ways is ROI affected by the support and resources, or in some cases, lack thereof, the SEO team receives? Um, and how do you overcome that? Uh, Corey, why don't you kick this one off? Yeah, so uh, in my opinion, SEO is greatly affected by the resources and support it gets 
just because it's so broad across the entire website and it touches every team that might be internal across marketing and product and, and everything. Um, and so for me, the best way to manage that and make sure that we are all on the same page comes down to client education and having really, really good project scope, setting very good expectations about what the project and campaign looks like um, and what timelines will be and making sure that we um, over, under promise and over deliver. And so we're always meeting our own timelines and always asking for exactly the resources we need, setting clear timelines with the client and then producing what we say we will with those resources. Um, if we don't get the resources that we need, it skews entire expectations and it's a very great way to have a project go sideways, frankly. Um, and I think it really ties well into that, that last question we were talking about, which is making sure that you set up very achievable goals early on in the campaign, setting expectations, um, working on client education and um, making sure that that we're all sort of marching in the same direction at the same time and have the same expectations. Yeah, yeah, that's a great way to handle that, uh, essentially. I mean, if you don't have the proper expectations set, you could <laughs> under promise and also under deliver and that wouldn't be an ideal situation. No, certainly not. No. Um, Matt, how do, you, how do you deal with that? This is, a, this is an awesome question. I think one of, the blocks that I've experienced in house and in companies, uh, I think it comes from like PR and social uh, developers and uh, what I call creative marketers. I think that the creative market, I mean the PR and social one that can impact like your ability to go out and reach out to people, right. For link building and things like that. Um, I think the most interesting one that I've just experienced the most, especially in the past couple of years is this creative marketer block. What I mean by that is this is somebody, my mentor says that every marketer is either a demand gen marketer, a creative marketer, or a product marketer. And this usually comes when you're working with someone that's, uh, you know, has a product or a creative type of vibe to them. And you're trying to pitch a certain keyword that you want to go after. And the response that you always get is, well, our product doesn't really fit in that. That's not really what we do. Or that's not, or we do so much more than that, or that's only one aspect. And you, you just take for granted that you're the SEO and they're not. And marketers by trade are, fo are trained to focus on the differentiation of their product. So you have to understand that that's where they're coming from. And you have to play that educational role and say, yes, you know, you're right. But my question to you is how are we going to earn visibility from our target audience that perhaps aren't aware of this one or need that they that uh, you know that we provide or searching for something else how are we going to get in front of them unless we're targeting certain uh, topics and then tying our product and services into that it's a very basic concept for SEOs but over the past week I've had three different conversations with three different b2b marketing executives and that's been the feedback that I've gotten each time so it's I feel like I've been, been in the twilight zone recently it's been a great reminder that this is not something I can probably ever take for granted and that's fine. That's, that's our job as SEOs is to have these conversations and educate. Yeah, I, I really like that. I, I love starting to with education, talking about their search landscape, because as SEOs, it's very easy for us to take it for granted to know how users in their space are searching. And as you said, they're, they're trained to look for the differentiator and think about what makes their product unique. But as you said, not all, not all people that their product helps solves their problem, will know that that is the solution. And so you have to look for how are they searching to identify their problem and show them how competitors are ranking and what types of topics and pages, even if it doesn't seem directly tied to their own product. It's a great way to show, here's what your search landscape looks like, and here's where your competitors are winning, and here are the gaps you have across your own website. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. Fantastic, <laughs> uh, Eric. How do you uh, how do you handle that? So I like to uh, find a way to bring numbers into these kinds of conversations. So um, you know, in terms of overcoming resistance and lack of resources. So 
uh, you know, for me, if I can, um, you know, use tools like uh, SEM Rush or I have access to Search Metrics or Bright Edge or something like that, you know, pull the data uh, uh, on, you know, SEO visibility uh, or traffic guys are getting, uh, you know, so look at what's happening for our client, look what's happening for competitors. Uh, in many of these conversations, uh, the competitors are, are are doing really better uh, than uh, than than the client. I mean, even again, not to keep picking on you, Charles, but you're the one that had to walk in here with a big brand name uh, uh, associated with you. Um, so um, uh, you know, even at Verizon, right? Verizon has market sectors where it's pretty easy to do an analysis and show that in that particular sector, competitors are doing a lot better. And then what that allows you to do is say, okay, I have this visibility gap. Let's estimate what that means in terms of traffic. And then let's go back to the, where we were with the first question, which is what's the average conversion rate? What's the value per visitor of that traffic? Or if you already know the average uh, value per visitor, great. Um, and put a dollar value on it, and on the difference between you and the competition and say, look, these are the easiest dollars that our competitor is making. They're the cheapest sales they're getting uh, and, and that we're not. And right now, um, they're using that money that they're making in SEO as a strategic advantage for them, um, which, by the way, they can turn around and they can invest in more SEO and build on that advantage, or they can go put it in paid search or paid social or something else that helps drive their business. Um, and it just says, oh my God, these guys are making, you know, a uh, million dollars or X million dollars per year more than we are. And we're just leaving that on the table right now and, and underinvested. So if you could get it down to numbers like that, this works really well with the uh, CEOs, CMOs, um, you know, maybe not as well with CTO types. And you have to think about, you know, who you're talking to as well. But, um, that's that's what I like to try to do with it. Yeah, nothing uh, hits harder than attaching it to a dollar, right? You got it. You know, suddenly, and it's and it's also just the fact that it's a competitive advantage. The other guy, you're giving it away to the other guy. Yeah. Why would you want to do that? Yeah, if that doesn't motivate you, I don't, I don't know what will. <laughs> yeah, Charles, uh, how do you deal with? Um, or is this a problem of yours in uh, a large enterprise situation of getting, you know, lack of support? Um, you talked about getting buy-in from uh, various people. Yeah, no, everyone just always does exactly what I ask. <laughs> no, that's a joke. No, that does not happen. <laughs> um, yeah, no, Eric was 100% right. I, and, and I see Matt put a comment in the chat about the keyword gap. I think keyword gap analysis are awesome because uh, it's 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 great to show it's a great way to say hey here are our top competitors and often i found the top competitors aren't even performing that well in the serps but they might be performing better than us so you can show a great keyword gap analysis say look here's where people are playing and i always use the term it does i use it internally i say this is a, a verizon free zone meaning our competitors have free reign to say whatever they want in this space and we're not we're not talking about that and the brand and the marketing folks understand that perfectly um so that's that's one way I've done it. Um, another another thing I've done. This is both. Um, I've done this in, in many organizations. I, I've sometimes been told by folks, "Well, we don't want to optimize that. We're not interested in search traffic to this." And, and that always, you know, to me, that sounds like you know heretic, you know, basically. But <laughs> um, but so what I'd ask them, I say, "Okay, well, this is how much traffic this part of the site is getting that we want to de-optimize or unindex for whatever reason, or this is this is the potential traffic that that launching this product would get." what would it cost to buy this traffic? And, and typically I'm, I'm speaking with, this is when you start getting to the, um, uh, especially the folks that are in charge of the money, I'll say, how much would it cost to buy a million impressions via digital, you know, digital marketing? And, and so it's like, oh, it'll cost X number of dollars. I'll say, okay, I can do that in you know, X amount of time with this much, this much energy. And, and it makes it very real. So I, I ask that question a lot when, when folks sometimes don't, want to invest in the time for SEO or, or they feel like it's going to slow down. And that's really the resistance I get is, is someone in an IT department says, yeah, we can do that, but it's going to slow it the launch down. The launch is now going to take an extra month or an extra two months. And, and the, you know, the executives don't want to wait. They got to get to get to market fast. And, and so my response is typically, okay, here's what we could give you. 
uh, over time, obviously. But here's what we could give you. What, if you don't want to do SEO, what would it cost you to buy to make up this lack of traffic? And that makes it real, real, really real immediately. Um, and, and folks, it, typically the walls break down. And everybody understands, okay, this is important. Absolutely. Again, tying it back to a dollar amount, I think, uh, seems to be the most effective way to yep. get that buy-in and understanding from, from every, every uh, involved party. Everybody, big or small organization, everybody understands numbers, especially if there's a dollar sign in front of them, and everybody understands charts. You can show anybody a chart or a number, and they know exactly what you mean. Yep. It clear and effective. Absolutely. So Charles, we're going to move into your uh, area of expertise here. Um, and we're going to talk about SEO testing. So the question is, how has SEO testing helped you find better opportunities to optimize websites? And do you have any examples of where it's had particularly powerful impact on the results? Yeah, no, SEO testing, I think that's huge. I think it's under underdone in a lot of SEO circles, or if it is being done, no one's talking about it, uh, which may be <laughs> maybe what's really happening. It is a lot of times, and this is, if, if someone's out there who has a small agency or, or a small agency, this is a great way to keep from doing things that don't need to be done. Um, a, 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 here's a great example. A typical SEO tool will go out and tell you that, um, that uh, these keyword title, these title tags are all too long. You know, they're all, you know, 100 plus characters or they're 85 characters and again it's a number so when uh you know directors of marketing will not see that they immediately want to panic but it's something they can wrap their head around so they want to start spending time on it so my questions and, and i always ask and this i ask my team how do you know what you know and if they were come back well you know oh well google said and i don't ever want to hear that um or, or i read an article on moz nothing against moz but how do we know that that's accurate? So I would say, test it. Let's figure it out. And, and um, the title tag was a great example. So we ran a little simple test. We put a unique keyword at the end of 100 characters. Google picked it up. I'm not suggesting that's going to get you to the top of the rankings by having a character at the end of 100, uh, having a keyword at the end of 100 character title tag. But the point is, Google's reading it. Uh, so that means, should we be panicking if our title tag is going over 60 characters, 70 characters, 80 characters? Probably not. Do we still want to lead with the most important stuff? Definitely. Um, I, I actually have testing that, can sh that shows that the, the further in front your keyword is, typically the better it does, um, or I should say the shorter the title tag is, typically the better it does. Um, but that's how, now I feel like I know what I know now. I can very confidently say that. And uh, one of the big pushbacks you'll get in any organizations from IT, sometimes you'll get an IT person who's like, oh, I've done some SEO. I did SEO five years ago, so I, I, know, what I, have, I know how to do that. And I'll, I'll, don't try to fight with them. I just say, well, here's what I've seen. Um, great examples of one time, this is a couple of years ago, somebody wanted to put keywords in the, in the image title uh, attribute, not the alt text, the title attribute. Um, and they said, well, that's, Google reads that, Google doesn't read the alt text, and I write an article seven years ago or whatever, and I said, well, let's just test it. So let's just be crazy, let's just try it out. So we did that, we had an image, a uh, couple images on a page, same keyword, put one in the alt text, one in the title, one in, one in the keyword, uh, one in the um, file name, put one in, had all of them, and we did actually multiple combinations to see what actually worked. And we found at the time, and again, this is at the time, the alt text was the only thing Google seemed to be reading and using for on-page optimization purposes. Uh, and so it wasn't me saying, no, you're wrong. It was like, let's test it. Here are the results of the test. And then immediately the person was like, oh, that's really cool. And, and actually they ended up working really well with us. They wanted to run all kinds of tests all the time um, because they found it interesting. And it was, and it's, and the key was it saved time and energy. We didn't spend time and money doing something that has no impact on SEO. And I think there's a lot of SEOs and I'm guilty of it all the time too, spending time and energy on things that don't actually impact their SEO. Um, so I do that. I, I also, as a, another little side note, uh, I always yell at my team about backwards explaining. We do that a lot as SEOs. Something happens and then we explain why it happened. But we didn't use that explanation long before it ever happened. We didn't say, well, this is gonna happen and this is what I expect to happen. We wait for it to happen and then we try to backwards explain it. So maybe we're right, maybe we're wrong. But I always kind of ex uh, use the example of, you know, on Monday someone explains you know, why someone lost the, you know, lost the football game. Well, where was your opinion on Friday? Were you saying that same thing on Friday or are you the Monday quarterback? And, and that, we kind of do that too. And so I try to not do that myself. I'm still guilty of it. Um, I, I always kind of go back to how do you know what you know? And, and really testing is the only way uh, you can confirm that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, based on what we've seen uh, just through the various years, 
um, in the industry. We, we have hunches that we like to think that we know certain things, but definitely testing it, uh, you know, really is the, the solid answer there. That's, that's great. I, I've had tests that have come back and blown me away. And I said, I was sure Google wasn't doing this or was doing that. And I just couldn't get the test to do it. I'm like, I don't think that's happening. And, and you, there's still always that. And I always go back to this is our hypothesis and this is our observation. There's never really a fact. And I, and I was like, based on our observations, this is what I recommend we do. Because we never really know for sure. And I always try to keep tests running as long as possible because Google changes. You know, Google may take keywords out of a, out of a, out of a meta keywords tag, you know, 12 years ago, but they haven't. But then for some reason, they start doing it again. I don't think that's happening, but I don't know. I'd have to run a test to be able to confirm that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, Matt, what's, uh, what's your take on SEO testing? Uh, I mean, my take is that it's a language that I always try to hold myself accountable to speak within um, because it's just the best way. It's a much better way to speak rather than if we do X, you know, Y is going to happen. If we do this optimization, it's going to be awesome. It, just phrasing things as a test, you know, providing some data or something to support your hypothesis. Um, you know, taking that page out of growth marketing professionals I've learned from has really helped me. Um, I don't do, I know that testing is particularly huge with e-commerce sites, pages like, uh, you know, that have just, uh, thousands and thousands of these uh, page templates. Um, you know, my world has been a little bit less like that recently. So my type of tests is more, um, you know, what type of page optimization am I making? Uh, my hypothesis around it, look at a two week uh, span of data in Google search console, uh, you know, check out the clicks and impressions of various keywords, report on that, and then iterate from there. And just, ha and then, you know, repeat itself over and over again. That's been my, uh, you know, most recently I've been doing that with featured snippets um, and uh, just generally improving the performance of pages. Yeah, yeah, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it, it sounds like a lot of the SEO testing that we do is essentially myth busting. You know, we, we hear something that gets tossed around the industry and um, a lot of people will take one person's word for it and then next thing you know six people write an article about it and now everyone just adopts that as truth when in all reality if we actually put it to the test we might all see different results uh, eric what's what's your take on it so i think one of the important things for everybody to realize too is uh, a test that might work a, a, a way on one website could work differently on another um, so for example it may be on verizon.com that you know you have something that's 100 characters out in the title tag and the the word gets indexed or gets picked up by google and so it ranks for some related terms it might not actually behave that way on another website um and uh for that reason this is one of the, the things that makes testing so important if you find people you trust online uh and you know and you trust what they write, um, then you know you might rely on them to be sources of uh, you know potential wisdom or at least ideas. But you should still turn back around and plan on testing it in your own world, because the circumstances might not be the same. What caused it to work? So uh, you know, so this person who you know who writes a lot online, and, you know, I, I do obviously, but I'm not trying to pick on myself specifically, whoever it might be, um, you know, might be sharing a good general wisdom, but you don't know that it's going to be the same for you. So you should test it and find out. Um, and besides which, as Charles suggested earlier, there's all kinds of assertions and facts and fiction running around out there too. So uh, you want to sort that out. The other comment I wanted to add around the testing side of things is to do it well, right? You have to choose an appropriate scale, right? If, I, if I'm doing a very simple test to see whether or not someone's picking up uh, a, a title attribute and images, uh, I might not need to have a particularly large scale test. Uh, I, you know, uh, I, I might be able to get what I need from a single page, but you know, better still, I'd be doing it on 10 or 20 or something where it gets a certain amount of scalability out of it. 
But if I'm trying to compare one approach to title tag structure for a group of 500 pages, then um, what I should do is make sure that I change a set of those pages and don't change the other set. So I have a test group of pages and a control group of pages, and I can measure them against each other and see which one of those uh, work better. The control group is important because let's say you make your changes to the title tags on 250 of the 500 pages, uh, and they go soaring in rankings, but you're not checking your control group, uh, or if you just ran the test on all the pages, you don't know that it's some other external factor, like some Google algorithm tweak that caused things to soar. Um, so you really wanna have some discipline about how you approach it, and, and to make sure that you're getting enough data based on the nature of your test to have certainty or a reasonable amount of certainty with what the result is telling you. And what's a reasonable timeline to implement with these control tests? So that, that's, that's almost a trick question. <laughs> um, uh, and um, so it depends on the variance of the data. Yeah. In other words, if I run a test, let's use my example of having 500 pages and 250 I test and 250 I use as the control. If the variance in the results between the test group and the control group is small, then I need to run the test much longer to have certainty to be sure that it's meaningful. Whereas if the, the test group, uh, let's say, rapidly shows major gains over the control group, then you don't need to run the test nearly as long. So in statistics, what this gets down to is the degree of the, the variance in the results actually helps dictate how long you need to run the test to have a high level of confidence in, in the results. Well, that was a non-mathematical answer, but there's a lot of math in doing it right. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Corey, you, you know, I just want to just jump in real quick. Eric made a great point. There could be so many variables out there. Um, so, like for example, I don't test like I don't test on Verizon.com. I should probably say that very clearly. I do not test on Verizon.com. <laughs> I wouldn't. That's, I don't think my boss would like that very much. What I try to do, one of the things I, I I get new domains often because what I'm always trying to figure out is what's the base Google response. I want to eliminate as many variables as possible. So if I have, let's say I'm running a test and, and we'll just keep title tag, title tag length as an example. I'll have 10 different pages. I'll keep the content the same on those pages. Um, I do find you have to have the, the meta description has to be different. Otherwise Google won't index all the pages, but if you change up the meta description, yeah, you see the content, you see the duplicate content filter, but you just click the button and you can, you know, you see everything on the page. I always try to eliminate as many variables as possible because Eric's right. Once you get out in the wild, out in the SERPs, all kinds of things can impact these stuff. And, and it really goes back to, you know, you want to duplicate your tests. I, I have folks I work with. I'm always, you know, both internally and, and, and in other companies that I just know through the industry. I'm always like, hey, I just got this wild test. Can you replicate this? Can you do this too? Um, and uh, like I said, it's never really over. I've never really come to a point where I'm like, yep, this is the fact. This is what it is. I'll come to like, this is how I would do it now. If I, you know, I would do this and I would do this. But it, it takes, it all takes a lot of documenting. Oh my God, I cannot tell you how many times I've thought I documented and it was very clear. And then I go back and I look at my test and I realize, why did I make a note about this? It's kind of like folks who code know that you make sure you put lots of comments in your code because when you go back, you won't know what the heck you were trying to do in your code. It's the same thing. I document, I I, I document everything because I find that a month later I'll go back and look at stuff and I'll forget why I did this or why I did that or when exactly did I do that. Um, but um, it, it, it finds the documentation is a, is a huge part. Having that control, um, you know, and, and then knowing that you're never really sure, you're never a hundred percent done, but you, but you can at least have that confidence, uh, not talking about the statistical confidence that Eric was referring to, but you just have that internal confidence. Like, okay, I kind of cover this subject now. I kind of know what it is that Google seems to do and at a very, again, at a very base level, because he's hundred percent right. Google will do things for Verizon.com that it will never do for, you know, Charles's, you know, uh, gift emporium.com. That's, that's, that won't, <laughs> that won't get the love that, that, that a large brand will get for sure. 
but I'm going to visit that site right now. Charles Gift Emporium. Yeah, got it. Yeah, everybody's running. The, everybody's running the, the GoDaddy right now to see if that's <laughs> see if that's out there. Yeah, <laughs> that's not a real site. So if you want to buy it and think you're going to, you know, hold me hold me over the barrel, you're not getting me. <laughs> we'll, we'll be willing to do some tests for you. Whoever buys it. Indeed. Um. Yeah, Corey, what, a, what have you seen with uh, SEO testing and any different opportunities that you found um, with the, the tests that you've done? Yeah, I mean, I just echo what all of these fine gentlemen have said here. Um, I think, honestly, I really like what Matt had to say about trying to live by this. Um, I think all of SEO is a bit of a test and ever-changing to some degree. And it's upon all of us to always be doing what we believe is the best work possible and documenting the results as much as possible so that we can do better work for our clients in the future. Um, so thinking about it at the experimental level, I'm constantly curious about how easily can I rank for given levels of different terms, especially thinking about new websites, um, established websites, websites that are authoritative in a parallel space um, compared to a new topic that they've never pushed into. I'm constantly doing small level content experiments to see how well can I rank for what appears to be a gap in a SERP with either a new website or a website that has very little established authority or a website that has a lot of established authority. Um, I think that is one of the things that interests me most is that, that how easy is it to rank with a targeted piece of content. Um, another thing that I, and to think in an entirely different direction, I think we've talked a lot about um, the technical elements of experimentation, but we do a lot of link building internally here at Page One Power. And one of the primary ways we build links is to promote content on our client sites. We look at what kind of content they have, um, what websites might be willing to link and what websites link to similar content. And we basically do manual outreach and say, hey, you link to this piece of content here, or you mentioned this thing here, and we have a really great resource that we think your visitors might love. Well, um, personally, I've been pushing an experiment internally to look at what other opportunities exist on client sites beyond content because we all know we can do manual outreach for content for client content to help that content rank to build right mm -hmm. but what they really want to affect is their business pages pages like their pro their products their category pages um industries they serve things of that nature um and so i'm running an experiment internally right now where we do very similar outreach as we would for content for those category pages or for those product pages or for those location pages or anything of that sort that is more directly tied to a business goal than that content. Now we can tie the content to the business goal, but it's not as closely tied as some of these, um, these other pages that we are doing outreach on now. And um, the results are somewhat what I would have expected going into it, but there has been surprises that I've learned within this, and it will affect how we do outreach and link building for our clients in the future. And I think that's the type of experimentation that we all should be doing forever within SEO, because it, it's honestly, the algorithm is forever changing um, to some degree. And honestly, one thing that I've always seen, and I've heard it echoed here in this webinar today, is that it varies across websites, across industries, across everything. And you just always have to be testing and put your best hypothesis forward and test that and be willing to test that. So that's kind of my large scale thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, as SEOs, we need to constantly be checking ourselves and making sure that we are up to date and we know why things are ranking the way they do. Um, how can we, I mean, this, I, I'm not sure who I'm going to direct this to first, but um, how can we encourage all the other SEOs out there to do more tests and document them um, and, you know, publish them, publish your testings, whether it's a, a fail or a success, whatever those are, how can we encourage the SEO community to do more testing to uh, essentially just give the rest of us more insight on the tests that everyone else is doing? Um, Charles, why don't you start with that off? So one of the things I always ask, again, it goes back to what I said, it, how do you know what you know? Um, is, it, is it just something you've always kind of believed? It? It's amazing how many just beliefs we have that, I, there's even beliefs I have that I couldn't even tell you how, why I think that. It's just, I think X. Um, so whenever my team says, oh, we're going to do this and it's going to impact rankings, 
typically I'll ask, how do you know it's going to impact rankings based on what based on what are you making this decision? Um, and, and so I really kind of challenge everyone now, I, and, and I've probably gotten a little obnoxious internally here where I keep asking the same question, like, how do you know, how do you know? Uh, and um, because I don't want us doing things on guessing. I, I really want to be able to do things based on data because that's what our clients and, and internal clients or, or if, you, if you have an agency, you're in client, they're really looking for you to do. It, it's not that um, if you had an auto mechanic and they said, well, here's a, I'm going to try this out and just see what happens. You say, whoa, 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 I don't want you touching my car. and <laughs> Just want to see what can happen. You should be able to explain to me why this is going to be better and why you think such and such is going to, going to improve the performance of my vehicle. Um, and so I try to do the same thing and turn out. I, I really think we need, as an industry, we need to get away from the kind of the, the black magic approach and, and trust me, I'm an SEO. And I, look, I still do that all the time. I say, look, I've been doing this for years. Trust me, I know what I'm doing. We got to get away from that because it doesn't, it doesn't help us as an industry. Uh, if we want to be taken seriously as we want to be taking you know taken seriously as marketers and or data scientists we, we really need to make sure we have that data and that and, you know and the heart and and proof or as much as proof as you can never get on anything behind what we're going to say you don't say you know do this because i'll pick on eric because he's he's the big name here he's like oh i'm eric you, you should do what i say and and he probably he's probably right but if he can say well this is this is what i think we should do here's why I think we should do it. And here's either what we've done with other clients or here's tests we've run. Suddenly it stops being an opinion and it starts being fact, it starts being something you can really rely on. And it, and it gives a lot, it'll give, and it'll give anyone a lot more uh, credibility again with their internal or external clients because it's, it's not Charles making wild guesses and, 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 uh, and making, you know, and saying, you know, just trust me because I'm the smartest guy in the room. It's, well, here's what we've seen and here's why I believe this. We try to, you know, all our, Stuff. We try to leverage as much data as possible for exactly the reasons you say, Charles, because, uh, you know, it, let's be honest, there are going to be parts of your day as an SEO where, where you have to go based on your interpretation of things and your experience, and this is your best guess as to how Google might think about that, and we'll never make that entirely go away in, in a world where, um, you know, the dominant player has a strategic a priority of not revealing how they work. Um, so, um, but uh, data is wonderful. Uh, and, you know, you want to make that the driving conversation of everything you can do. But, uh, Jordan, to your question, what I find is that um, it's painful in many cases trying to persuade people to take on testing. Um, there's, there's an inherent resistance and we, we try to, um, you know, get really a very large percentage of our tech clients, you know, thinking that way and, uh, um, and, and being progressive enough to take that on. And, uh, and it, a lot of times they just won't, they, they don't have the, the bandwidth, the energy to, to they take it on themselves or to let us do it for them. We get to do it in some clients and we love those opportunities because it's a very fruitful thing to pursue. But you have to realize that persuading people to do it, it's like there's a lot of people who are very resistant to it. Why do you think that is? Do you think it's, I mean, from a, an agency perspective, do you think the client is worried about you spending their time that they're paying for? with just testing things rather than just doing what they paid for? Like, what, what do you think the resistance is there? Well, I, I could capture it one way. I'll, I'll, give, I'll give a, I can't say who the company is, but it's a Fortune 50 uh, e-commerce company that I was on the phone literally two hours ago. And we were talking about some structural changes that they need to make to their site, the taxonomy is broken. I, I actually don't need to do any testing to make that assessment. We, you know, there's just really basic problems with it. But, um, so it doesn't relate to SEO testing in that sense, but in the sense that it does is talking to them, it's like, okay, so we, we can come back with these uh, set of fixes uh, to the overall taxonomy. And what they said to me was, Best case we have for getting that on the dev, uh, in the dev priority queue, not actually implemented, but just in the queue, is second half 2019. Wow. So, um, you know, 
someone in a situation like that isn't going to be rushing out there to say, let's run six tests simultaneously. <laughs> the ability to do things is so, so much mired in the reality of their um, you know, internal organizational limitations that, yeah, it's just that that's can be a big blocker. So by the time they get around to having something to do and how long it will take them to get it done, they kind of have to, you know, just make your best guess. <laughs> that's what happens. Oh man. Yeah. That, uh, that can definitely be difficult, especially for large organizations. I'm sure Charles can attest to that. Um, yeah, all, all my town, the point, I mean, that's a great point about all my testing, Charles Taylor foots the bill. I, I buy my own domains. It's all my own time. It's, I, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not even worth the hassle of trying to talk to dev resources and setting up servers. And then you've got the problem where I'm sitting on a Verizon server that could be affecting the test somehow. So, um, and it goes back to, I try to keep it as basic as possible. That, I mean, that's a great point. Clients, they won't, to them, it's a waste of time. It, it's, you know, do, do you know, don't you know this stuff already? You should already know it. And, and it's, that's kind of their, their philosophy, even if they don't say it out loud. Um, so yeah, trying to convince them to do it and spend their resources, they, they, they will want to. They'll, it, it's, a, it's a black hole as far as they're concerned. Yeah, yeah, we can definitely see that a lot here too. Uh, Matt, what's your, uh, what's your recommendation on an increasing and encouraging more people to do SEO testing? Um, what's my recommendation on it? Well, there's a reason why TripAdvisor and Wayfair are cleaning up right now. They both have teams dedicated to SEO tests. They have developer teams dedicated to that, right? So you can just see it like plain as plain as heck in the industry and look at the people that are working at these companies. Um, this is a tough question and I don't know what the answer is, but I've definitely, uh, tried to make it a point to have more coffee with people and reach out to people in the SEO industry and, and have dinner with them and, uh, you know, learn what these obstacles are and, uh, learn about, you know, for the organizations that are testing, those are the people that I really want to have coffee with and figure out what's, what's all the data that they're finding that they're not publishing. Cause that's really, you know, when I first learned about SEO and came into the industry, I was really blown away by how generous people were publishing their data, how much they're willing to help each other. It was this phenomenon I hadn't seen before in the marketing industry. I was, it was awesome. Uh, and then the second, that realization was, Oh, well, there's also a, lot, a whole group of professionals that are killing it and amazing that aren't doing that. So how can I go and find those people and meet them? Because um, over coffee, it's, you know, it's a different conversation than publishing on a blog post or something. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. We just want to encourage everybody, you know, do more testing, publish results, talk about it, um, you know, attend a trade show, speak about it, talk about, you know, what you're doing. It helps the rest of the community out. And, great ways. Um, Corey, what's, uh, what's your take on encouraging more people to do SEO testing? I think we're all optimizers at heart. I think that's how you end up here. Um, you, there is no straightforward path into SEO. And so we all at heart have to be the kind of people that are curious and that want to optimize any given situation. Um, and I don't know that there is one answer to this. I think it is just encouraging each other to share information more often and and that's the only way forward. I think that we all see as an industry how much more powerful it's made us to have a tight knit community. And I, I would echo what, what everyone here has said is that it's such an important part of, of who we are. So I think that that's the only thing that you can say is continue to, to share and, and uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, so, but sorry, what was, was that? So Jordan, I'm going to need to drop off, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. We uh, I was about to just wrap it up. We've uh, oh, okay. we've, we've hit all our uh, our time today. Uh, that hour went by really quickly. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, it's been a fantastic conversation. I'm so thankful for all of you guys' responses. Um, thank you, Eric, Charles, Corey, Matt, for taking the time. Uh, lend us your insights. Um, if any of you have any other further questions, um, I'm sure these guys would be happy to. Uh, answer them um, up on the screen. We have their uh, Twitter handles. Uh, reach out to them. Um, today's webinar was brought to you by Pages, the SEO magazine for marketers. Pages is published quarterly, and our next issue drops in January. Make sure to subscribe at uh, pagesseomagazine.com to get the next issue sent to your home or place of business. Uh, thanks again to all of our panelists. Thank you all uh, for those of you taking the time out of your day, and uh, have a great rest of your day.
All right. Thank you. Have, have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye.